We thank you that you're so good. So very, very good. And I pray that as I share today, that whatever you want me to say will be said. And whatever in my notes shouldn't be said, that you would show me, Lord. So I will only speak the words that you would want me to share with this body of believers. We thank you that you are with us, no matter what we go through in life. You are there. And Lord, you are such a comfort. You so comfort me, Lord, in everything of my life. And I am so glad for you, Jesus. So very, very glad. So bless us now as we uh, share. And let us, Lord, uh, hear your voice. That we might hear what you would say to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I titled this, God is Supreme and in Control. God is everywhere making himself known. He goes after us many times in our lives. How many of you could say that? You would say, I have felt God pulling me many, many times in my life. Raise your hand. You have? Honestly? Yes. You feel God pulling you. You feel the Holy Spirit moving in your life. And God is everywhere. And he, I don't think that anybody on Judgment Day will be able to say that God never gave me a chance. I think he has given everybody a chance. Many chances. Many, many, many chances. I also think that the people who didn't have knowledge of him, the conscience, their heart, and their, their conscience will testify of whether or not they believed in him. And he knows that. He knows about them. And he's the judge. So he ultimately will decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. We don't get to decide that, but he decides that. So I believe that. And I believe that, that all my family who are lost... They have been given multiple opportunities to know Jesus, but they choose not to, or they're, bl they're blinded by the things of the world, and they, they don't see him, but I know that he's prodding, and I, I think about how he prodded me, and how he came into my life, and how he opened my eyes to see him, and I saw him, and I knew he was real, and so God is everywhere. He's making himself known. Jeremiah 23, 23, and 24 say this in the Good News Bible. I am a God who is everywhere and not in one place only. No one can hide where I cannot see them. Do you not know that I am everywhere in heaven and on earth? He made himself known to my father and to my mother, and he made himself known to me and to my family. And my family came to know Jesus because my dad's friend witnessed to him and told him about Jesus. And then my family became Christians. We all became Christians. Because, you know, if your mother and your father are serving the Lord and they start taking you to church to Sunday school, things begin to happen, right? And so I, as a little girl, remember in Trinidad, these people had a church. It was a makeshift church behind their house. And we would go into this old building and there would be church and there would be um, benches outside because, you know, it's a tropical climate. There would be benches on the outside of the church, on the sides of the church for Sunday school. And we would go outside and we would sit all the different classes when we dismissed for Sunday school. And we'd go out there and our teachers would teach us right out there on the side of the church. No building, just outside in the open air. And I remember as a little girl that my heart was enthralled with Jesus. And that one day we had a play, some kind of play. I don't even remember what it was. Uh, but it was a play about Easter and how, or it must have been, yeah, uh, Jesus was going back to heaven. And whoever played in that, was the actor in that play, they actually opened up the roof of the building, whatever the building was, makeshift, I don't remember how it was. And I actually saw this guy going up. And when I saw that, it made such an impression on me that I believed I had seen Jesus. And I'm telling you, those are, those are the kinds of things that happened in my life over and over again, that Jesus was just drawing me, and I was seeing him, and I was knowing that he was with me. And when I was a little girl, uh, I, was, I was just amazed. I'm, today I look back and I think, I'm so amazed that Jesus would save me, that he would find me on this little island, and he would, would move in my life and my family, and he would bring me to this place where I would know him to the point that I loved him just so much as a kid, and, and as I grew up, I loved him, and I could feel him calling me. I could feel him calling me, just like he was calling Abraham out uh, of the earth, the Chaldees, to go to the promised land, and I felt like Jesus was calling me, and Jesus was uh, telling me that I was going to serve him, and then one day, you know, I was horrible at math uh, in school, 
And I had one of my teachers, I would go to her house to have, um, to, she tutor me. And she was a Christian. And I remember her, she told me one day, she said, I had a dream about you and your family. She said, and, and uh, you know, got to know her really well, loved her. And she said, I saw this, this picture of a, of a nest, a bird's nest. And uh, the, in the nest, there were these little birds. And I don't think she might have even said five little birds. And, and they know the mama bird and the dad bird. And she says, and I see this picture, and I see that you guys are going to leave. And she's telling me this, and I'm still in high school, right? I haven't graduated, but I know that God's calling me. And she says, um, you're going you're, you're, you're gonna to leave the nest, and you're going to go away. And God's going to work in your life. And I don't remember all the things she said, but I always remember her telling me this. And I had, at that point, I had no idea I was going to move from Trinidad to come to, a, to Eugene to go to college and all of that. But, but there was this thing in my heart that I knew that God was calling me to serve him. And I was singing in Trinidad, and I was serving in my church and doing all those things. But then I felt him calling me to ministry. And, and my mom says that when I was a little girl, I would sing. They'd have, we had prayer meetings at our house. Every once in a while, my parents would invite friends and neighbors over and we'd have our pastor come and we'd sing songs and they'd talk about Jesus and then our neighbors would get saved. They would give their lives to Jesus. In fact, we had one neighbor who lived right next to us that gave their family, gave their lives to Jesus and they're still serving Jesus today. And, uh, and that's just how people did things. So we were at this prayer meeting. My mom told me I would always get up and I would sing because I was a singer, you know, and I would sing. And I would say, one day I'm going to marry a pastor. I would say that as a little girl. And I, I don't remember that. But my mom says, yeah, you'd always say it. You're going to marry a pastor. You're going to serve Jesus. And I thought it's just funny, you know, how life works out, right? So anyway, I felt like God was calling me. He was calling me. And uh, he was telling me, you know, you're going to serve me. And I want you to go to Bible college. And I want you to do this. And of course, that's a, that was a process if, in living in Trinidad because now you have to get a visa from the American embassy. You have to show that you can, uh, your parents can afford to keep you in school, all of these different things. But through a process, and I had to pass all my exams at school. And I don't know how many of you love school, but I did not love school um, growing up. School was hard for me. And part, one of the reasons it was hard for me is because we traveled and my parents lived in, we lived in Guyana for a couple of years. And so I ended up skipping a grade. It's not a good idea to skip a grade because it really puts a, a dent into your foundation. So school was hard. And uh, I had to pass my exams. And I'm sure my teachers in, in Trinidad, we had a British, British system of school at that point. And uh, I had to pass my O-levels. And then if you pass your O-levels, then you have to go on for two more years and do your A-levels. Well, some people don't go on and do A-levels. You just do the O-levels. And these are not like, oh, go fill out a paper and here's your exam. These are exams that you have to write. And you have to, to do all the work. And it takes a long time. It's a month of exams when you, when you do this. And so anyway, I was like, Lord, I can't go to Bible college if I don't pass my exams. I have to pass. And how am I going to do that, Lord, without you helping me? So I got down. Into, I went in my room, and I locked the door. And every time there was an exam, you know, I would just bust the books. You know, just study, study, study. And prayed and prayed and prayed. And I was like, Lord, you have to help me. You have to help me. I think I was a kid in that time who would have been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD or whatever. And um, because, you know, focusing was a big deal and nobody knew what that was. And, and uh, my teachers just think, wow, why are you not getting this, you know? So now I, in retrospect, I look back and, you know, Charlie and Charles goes, I think you were ADD or you were ADHD or whatever it is, right? And I'll go, I got it done, okay? So I got it done. So anyway, so I studied hard for this whole month, a very intense time. And studying and going and doing my exams and all of that. And then when the results came out, I passed all my exams. And my teachers, I'm not kidding you, and my, I went to a girls' high school. We go, the day the exam results come out, you go to your school, your high school, and hundreds of kid girls, right? And everybody's a little nervous. Because <laughs> you don't know, it's not in the paper yet. Then they put it in the paper. They put if you fail or if you pass. And, what, and all those things, right? So I go to my thing and I go to get my paper. That's my teacher hands me the envelope or the principal, you know. And you're nervous as ever. And I opened it up and I passed. And I could tell my teachers were stunned. 
They were stunned, absolutely stunned. And I was so like, God, you are amazing. Thank you for helping me. And, uh, and I think my, the principal of the school happened to be my father's, one of my father's cousins. And I think she was just so tickled pink that I passed my exams, you know. And uh, so then I could go ask for uh, um, a reference, you know, because <laughs> now I'd pass my exams, you know. So anyway, um, long story short, uh, I could see God making the way as I worked with him, as I did what I was supposed to do. And my what I could do was pretty um, limited, but what he could do was amazing. So I get through my exams, and I do all the stuff, and I, I'm on my way to America. 18 years old, I'm on my way to America. And remember, this is 40-something years ago. The world was so much different then. People were so much nicer. I mean, well, as far as, you know, crime and violence and all of that, it was a, it was a different world. You know, we all have dreams, right? And so God found me there, and he gave me a dream. He gave me a dream. And where did God find you? Where did God find you? What dream did he give you to work out in your life? Some of you are as old as I am, so you've already lived your dream. And you're moving on, right? We're moving on into retirement, whatever that means. And what are we supposed to do with that, you know? But some of us... Some of you are young, and you're thinking, what am I going to be when I grow up? What does God want for me? Well, he has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. And some of you are in middle-aged, and you're, you're going through life and doing all the things. you need. God has a plan for you, even in that mundane job that you may not think is what you want to do with your life. God has a plan for you. So he's everywhere, and he's making himself known, and he's making himself known to every single one of us. And you need to go back and ask yourself, where did God find me? Close your eyes for a minute. Where did God find me? When did I meet him? When did I have that experience with him that changed my life and is changing me as I go forth? The second thing I knew was that God called me to himself. He called me to himself. Do you talk to God honestly? I mean, really? Or are we just all playing, you know, oh, we're Christians. We come to church every day. Oh, I read my Bible and I, and I pray. But do you really examine your heart? Do you really look at its motives? Uh, the Bible says uh, in, e, in Ephesians 1.5, having predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to, to himself, according to the good will, good pleasure of his will, God called every single one of us. He's calling us. We are adopted as his sons and daughters. We, we have been called by him. But sometimes I think that we can get where we just walk this life. And we say, well, I go to Toledo Four Square Church and I do this and I do that. And yeah, and I, I teach Sunday school and I play in the band. And, um, you know, but then I stop and I say, wait a minute. Am I just playing being a Christian? Or am I truly a Christian? I ask myself these questions. I examine myself all the time. Because I don't want to meet Jesus and he says, I don't know you. I want to be sure that he knows me. And so I will ask myself these questions. Am I a hypocrite? Am I religious? Am I legalistic? Do I put on this thing of being religious? But am I really, really a child of God? I have to ask myself these questions. Um, I have to examine my hearts and my motives because I want to be right with him. It says in Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Is what I'm doing to serve him or myself? Am I a nobody who becomes a somebody in Jesus? And I think that when we're young, we're raised, I don't know about you, but in my culture, uh, East Indian culture, we're raised that we are to succeed, we are to do something with our lives, we are to go to college, we are to, to become somebody. And we have bought into the lie that we have to become somebody. And in America, it's that way too. We have to become somebody. We are already somebody. When Jesus died on the cross for us, he made us somebody. He made us somebody, but I want to be a nobody because so much of our lives, we want to be somebody that everybody recognizes, that everybody thinks, oh, I'm, they're, they're successful, they're wonderful, they're this, they're that, they have talents, but what I really want to be is nobody. 
I want to be empty. I want to be selfless. I want to be emptied out of my pride and all the things in me that make me uh, hurt God's heart. I want to be a nobody. And as you get older and you've lived your life, you realize it's no big deal. Why do we stress so much to be a somebody when God already loves us and we are somebody to him? And so I'm not saying we shouldn't have ambitions and, and dreams. I'm saying they're okay if we remember that Jesus goes with us in all of this. And Colleen Estenbrook, don't you leave church today unless I see you, okay? You always sneak out, but I want to see you. So I have to tell her that. So um, I'll sneak, I'll stay back from you, but I just want to talk to you. So anyway, God, I want to be a nobody so that I'm f- emptied of my pride and all the things in me that want to rise up and say I'm a somebody. And, and I think it's a, a freeing place to live when God comes into your life and it really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about you. All that matters is what he thinks. So I would ex- encourage us to examine our lives daily. Sometimes, have you ever been, I think it's, this comes up in another place, but I'll, I better not say it yet. Okay. I think it comes up here. Okay. Number three, do I serve him for what I can get from him or because I love him? Is he my genie in the bottle? I loved that show when I was a kid. How many of you know what I dream of genie was? Right? I even, Charles even brought me back one of those lamps from uh, when he went to Arab Emirates. He brought me back one of those lamps. Charlie took it. What's up with that child, you know? She took my lamp, you know? And it's a re- it was red, you know? Red's my favorite color. So he, she took it and it's in her apartment. But I was like, yeah, you know, I loved that show. And even when she was a little kid for one of our um, boot stomping nights, she dressed up as I Dream a Genie because we made her watch the whole series, right? <laughs> And so she wore that little I Dreamy Dream a Genie costume, and it's just so cute, you know? Anyway, right now I'm watching uh, My Three Sons. How many of you know My Three Sons? How many of you know that? Excellent, clean, funny show. That's the one I'm watching right now. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, he's not the genie in the bottle. Rub the bottle, get what I want. God, give me what I want. Uh, he's... he's uh, Do I love him because he's my genie in the bottle? Do I love him because he's a miracle worker? Is my heart pure and honest? Have you ever prayed a prayer and realized that you were trying to manipulate God into giving you what you wanted? You ever prayed like that? And then you realize, ooh, you could feel the Holy Spirit prompting you, telling you, that was not right, that was not right. And then you say to the Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, whatever your will is. Not what I want, you know. You realize he knew what was really in your heart. Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Every day, God, please create a clean heart in me, Lord. Uh, Have you ever, you know, you're dealing with people and you have a a wicked thought. Do you have wicked thoughts? Do you have thoughts that are are like, ah, I'd really like to get them. You know, uh, those kind of thoughts. We're human. We all have them. Okay. You annoy me. You know, that, that thought, I'm so annoyed with you, you know. We have those thoughts, but then we have to turn around and say, Lord, help me to have the right thought. Create this clean heart in me, God. and Renew my spirit so that I'm what you want me to be. And then four, we see a lot of suffering in our world today. I mean, I thought that my kids were suffering, and we've gone through a lot of suffering. You know, Charles being with his kidney issues. And uh, I have asked God many times, why, Lord? Why, why are you, why are we going to go through all this stuff, you know? Why, why is it that we've had, since Charlie was born, he was, uh, she was, he was 42. Since then, you know, he had 13 years of kidney stuff before we got to surgery. And then just stuff, stuff, stuff. And you, you're part of our church family. You know, you've prayed along with us. I have no idea what's wrong with us. Okay. I have no idea Why? right? I've thought about it. I've thought about, well, it's just life. Bad things happen to everybody, right? We all go through hard stuff. It's just, maybe Satan's attacking us. Maybe he wants to destroy us, which I believe he does. He wants to destroy all of us. And he will try to do it even down to the day you're dying. He will try to destroy you because if he can get you even on your deathbed, he will take you Because he does not want you to follow Jesus. He does not want you to believe in Jesus. So he will take you. 
however he can get you. And so we see a lot of suffering. I read stories. In fact, this last week I read a story. I don't know if you guys saw it. I don't even know who these people are. But Charles says that I, I always go for the sad stories. He says, whenever I'm talking to him, he says, why is it that you always pick up on the sad stories? Or the people who die, c c could you give me a happy story? So now I try to give him stories about, did you see the story in Florida about that alligator that was chasing the golf cart? Anybody see that? It was on the news there. And this golf cart and this alligator is coming and he's chasing the golf cart. That's a fun story, right? Well, it is a fun story. Nobody died, you know. Um, so lots, I look for all of those weird, quirky stories, and I tell them all of that, you know. But um, we see a lot of this um, struggle. And so in the news, there was a story about the guy, a guy who was an athlete. I don't know who he was. And he, I think he had ALS, and he died. And then five months later, his wife died. And so I, I, I seem to be seeing these stories a lot. And I start to think, well, there's just a lot of suffering in our world today. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of hard stuff. We're not the only ones going through hard stuff with our kids being sick or whatever's going on. And so I've struggled with that. And I've prayed and asked the Lord and wrestled with it. And, 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 but I've also come to learn that I trust him. I trust him even in the hard stuff, you know. So let's see. That's it. So I, let me look at my notes. So I struggle to understand all the whys of this life. And as I get older, you would think that it would get easier. It gets easier in the fact that we're more mature in Christ. But it doesn't get easier in watching it and living it. But we, we're more settled in him. We suffer so we can learn obedience like Jesus did. We suffer so we can trust the Father with our lives. Jesus submitted to his Father. We suffer so we can mature and grow to be strong saints. We suffer so we can decide if we really, really love him. That's a big thing right there. Do you really, really love him even when you suffer? Even when your family suffers, do you really, really love him? That's, it's eye-opening. I see my kids suffering and I wrestle with it. I don't know the answer. It rains on the just and the unjust. We suffer to glorify God in our lives. How we handle the problems. We suffer so we can arise and say, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Do you feel that? Lord, I want to see you. Lord, I want you to come back, Lord. I want, Lord, to be in your presence. And what I've learned is that God sees the completed picture of your life and my life. We can't see it. We don't know how it's going to end here on the earth. We know how it will end in heaven. If we know Jesus and we believe in him, then we know that heaven's coming and we're going to be forever in eternity but we don't understand the whys of how things are happening to us daily. But I want to encourage you to trust him, even in the suffering. Don't let Satan rip you off. Don't let him tell you God isn't real, that he doesn't care. He does. He's doing something in our lives, even in all the suffering. Job went through all of that suffering, and he still could see, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I hope that we can all say that today. I know that my Redeemer lives. And I'm going to be okay because he lives. So, where is the house of God? You know, in 1 Corinthians, uh, it, the house of God is in you. He's in here. The house of God is in you. Yes, this is the house of God. We come and we worship. But where does God live? He lives in you. You are the, don't you know that your body is a temple that belongs to the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit whom you received from God lives in you. You don't belong to yourselves. You were bought for a price. So bring glory to God in the way you use your body. And then in uh, Genesis 28, 10 through 22, Jacob, this is a story about Jacob and how he leaves uh, his family because, you know, he's stolen his brother's birthright and blessing. And he leaves to go to Padam Aram because he's going to go pick a wife from his relatives. And he has to take, spend the night on his way, many nights probably, but on the way, he has to lie down to sleep and he makes, takes a stone and makes it his pillow. That would be hard, wouldn't it? 
I would think that he would um, maybe have something that he could put on top of the stone, you know, so it wouldn't be so hard. But every time I think about that, I think, ooh, how uncomfortable would that be? So he makes this stone pillow, and while he's sleeping, he has this dream, and he sees a stairway uh, resting on the earth, and it's top reaching up into heaven, kind of like a ladder. And he's, uh, he sees angels going up the ladder, coming down the ladder, the stairway, going up and down, going up and down. And uh, he sees God is at the top. And he sees that God, God speaks to him and says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you back. This land, all of this stuff I've given to you. And you're going to inherit it. And so he has this dream. And he awakens from the dream and he says, surely God is in this place. And I was not aware of it. God is here. God is here. He said, the Bible says he was afraid. And he said, he said, how awesome is this place? There is none other than the, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. He took the, took the stone that he used as a pillow and he made an altar to God and he called it Bethel, Bethel, the house of God. And what we've learned is that as Christians, when we give our lives to Jesus, that he comes to live in us. And the Bible says that our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit and that our bodies become the house where God lives. And I would like you to think about that and think about What's going on in your house? What's going on in your house, in your life? What's going on in this body, in your heart, your mind, your soul? Is God glorified in it? What are you doing with your body? Are you making him, honoring him with it? Or are you hurting his heart with it? And then the next thing, I, these are all my thoughts at four o'clock in the morning. So sorry, okay? Um, the next thing that came in my mind was, would we need to stop sweating the small stuff? God's really in control. He's supreme. And we sweat a lot of small stuff. So one thing I sweat are snowstorms. When we have to go to Prineville, they really bother me. But part of that is, I think, is because years back when we were doing Mayflower moving people, we drive a big semi-truck in the snowstorms. And I really had to pray a lot because it totally, totally, totally stressed me out. Charles, of course, guys are so strange. They, they think it's an adventure. And th th who wants the, all the snow from the next truck slapping the window and you are totally blind for like a few seconds till that wiper goes, you know? And I remember us being in those kinds of storms and I absolutely hated them. And he was like, you know, annoying. And um, so anyway, I snowstorms bug me so I am always like we're not going over there if there's a storm you know and uh, he's like we have good tires on the car we'll be fine we can go over there right Carol we can go over there and she said they were coming over and she thought it was an adventure she's the opposite she's the guy and she says it was an adventure and, and then I was talking to somebody else says they're white knuckling it over there you know so anyway um, I think okay we can go because the roads are clear. And I even have trip check on my phone so I can go look at the cameras, you know. And if there's any snow, it's like we're not going, you know. So anyway, so which I think totally annoys Charles, but I don't care. I'm here to annoy him. So anyway, so then uh, we went over to Prineville. Get, going over, it was great. Clear roads, everything wonderful. We see them that night. We go back the next morning. And we got, we have to go. There's a storm, right? So... By 10 o'clock, we're on the road, and we're headed over the mountain. So we get to sisters, you know, the normal thing. And then once you start going up the mountain, then it starts snowing, you know. But you know what? I didn't sweat the small stuff this time. I actually was calm and felt good inside. I didn't say it out loud, because if I say it out loud, he's going to make fun of me, right? So I, I just said, wow, God, you are with us, no matter what happens, right? So we went over the mountain. We, it was a big storm. We were, actually got over before it became super big, but we got over fine. And Charles, of course, my new tires work really well. And, you know, you don't have to chain up with these new tires, blah, 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 blah. Okay, whatever. And um, so anyway, I didn't sweat it. God was with us. We did it. And, you know, the more you have things in your life where you overcome them, the easier it gets, right? So another thing, uh, so don't sweat it, sweating the small stuff, you know, getting your way. Do we always have to get our way? No. It's okay to let other people have their way too. 
And if you're married, it's okay to let your spouse have their way. Or if you're not married and you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, it's okay to let somebody else have their way. Your way is not always the best way or the right way or the, the only way. So don't sweat the small stuff, okay? Um, wisdom tooth. So I got to tell you my wisdom tooth story. So I had to have a wisdom tooth taken out. I'm 63 years old and I had to have a wisdom tooth taken out. I started thinking, that tooth's been in there for 63 years. This is going to not be so good, you know? So I, uh, so I had to go have it taken out, you know? I even went to the oral surgeon and I said, are you sure you're supposed to take this tooth out? He says, I think it's pushing on your other tooth up here. And so... Um, I think if we take it out, you won't feel that pressure. So, okay, fine, whatever. So then I go home and they call me and they go, well, we could move your appointment up. I go, are you crazy? I said, why would I want to move my appointment up? I'm not looking forward to this. I'm dreading this. So I think I'll keep the later date, if you don't mind. So, um, so I went, so Tuesday I was supposed to have it done. And uh, I told the ladies in Bible study, I need you guys to pray. If I have any pain, I will know you didn't pray. Okay? So... I will know you didn't pray for me. So I went Tuesday, got there early. It was 8.40 in the morning. I had to be there. Got there earlier. Got in there. And uh, the dentist came in and numbed my mouth. I didn't really feel anything. The little gal who was waiting with me, because he was doing surgery with somebody else, and he's moving back and forth. So um, the little gal who was in there with me talked to me, and we visited. And I had met her the first time, so we kind of continued. She was from Korea. And so I try to throw Jesus in there a little bit, you know. So got to take every opportunity you get to share Jesus. So anyway, started talking to her, and we talked about stuff. And so by the time she's talking to me, I'm relaxing. You know that you know that's not you get in your stomach when you feel uh, anxiety about something. So I can feel it. I can feel it getting better and better and better. So anyway, finally, by the time the dentist comes in, I'm feeling okay. I, I can handle this. Of course, I prayed the whole time, God. Give me courage. Give me courage. Give me courage. Because, I mean, how many of you like pain? Anybody like pain? Give me courage, God. So anyway, so the dentist comes in. He's really nice. And he says, um, okay, we're going to do this. And he says, I'm just going to warn you. It's going to creak and crack when he's pulling your tooth out. I mean, seriously? But you can hear like, you know, that, that sound. And he's talking to me, and he's taking the tooth out, and he says, I'm sorry, you have to hear the creak and the crack. Are you okay? Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he takes it out. So it comes out really fast and everything, and then you put gauze in your mouth, and I'm telling you, so in case you have to do this. And they fold it, and they put it in there, and I'm done. Then they give me four ibuprofen. I love ibuprofen. Um, they give me four ibuprofen, and they send me on my way. And I'm telling the truth. This is the absolute truth. I had absolutely no pain because every four hours I took Tylenol and Ibuprofen for a whole day. And after I took it for a whole day, that was Tuesday, Wednesday, I didn't need any. And God was with me. Why was I sweating it? Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. And you have things in your life that you're sweating about all the time, that you're worried about and you're concerned about. Give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. You'll get through it. Whatever we have to go through in this life, God has made a way for us so that we can get through it. Howard, God has made a way for you to get through tax season. You are going to make it. You made it all those years and you're going to make it again. We're all, all of us, no matter what we have to go through, how hard or how simple or how easy, whatever, God has made a way for you to make it. So we need to stop sweating the small stuff. We need to relax in the trial. We need to cry out to God. But know that he is peace in the storm. We need to trust him. And then the sixth thing. We will learn, grow, and mature until we die. We are not complete. And no matter if you get to be Lane's age of 93 or 94. I can't remember which one he is right now. Three. We still can learn. We still can grow because God is doing a work in us. It's not complete. If you're still here and you're breathing, it's because God is not finished with you. He's doing something in you, something new and fresh every day in our lives. We don't always feel that, but he is changing us. If we're following him, he is changing us. I find the trials are heavier as I grow older. I thought, you know, when I got to retirement age, life would be a breeze. Raise your kids. Everything's good. You know, easy street. But I haven't found it to be that way. I have found that the trials are there and some of them are really bad. But I have found that God is with us. Uh, 
that God is with us, even in the hardest things of our lives. And I think that the enemy, like I said before, wants to take us out. And he will try it till we die. Because that's his goal. That's his job. But we are stronger and we are mature. And we learn to trust him as we walk through the trial. And that's what I've learned in my life is that I have to trust the Lord. I have nobody else to go to. I can call you up and say, will you pray with me? Or will you help me through this thing? Or whatever it is, pray for me. But you know what? Having friends that pray for you really helps. It really helps. And so if you're going through some trial and you need people to help you, you should tell them. You should tell them so they can pray for you. I wake up in the nights and I pray for some of you because I know what you're going through. And I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God will show you that he is real. He will show you that you don't need people to bail you out. You need God to bail you out. And when God bails you out, yes, he uses people, but it's him bailing you out. That we put our trust in him, not in, the, in just people around us, even though it's wonderful to have friends. And it's wonderful to have people who help you. And people are a blessing in our lives, but we need to know that God is strong and he is going to take care of us. This life is not what it's all about. There's another one coming. And I know everybody says, well, you know, and I've said to the Lord that, Lord, are you really real? Lord, is heaven real? Have I served you all these years, Lord, for nothing? And I've come to know and to to realize how real he is how amazing he is, how good he is, how he takes care of everything. So remember that you're not just living for today. And when you're young, you think you are, okay? I think of Kendall, she's young, and she's just out of high school and, you know, moving on into life. I remember when I was that age. How old are you now? Okay, I was getting married when I was 19, okay? But I remember when I was that age and life was ahead of you and you just thought everything was so good. And then Kendall... I hate to tell you this, but soon you'll be 30, okay? Soon you'll, it'll just come, and you'll be like, how can I be 30? That is so old. And then when you get to 40, it's like a major, major, major upset. When I turned 40, I was like so depressed because I did not want to be 40 years old. And imagine how depressed I felt when I was 41 and found out I was having another baby. I was supposed to be... I was supposed to be reading books, going on trips, and having a wonderful, quiet life, right? And instead, a baby, what am I going to do with this baby? And, and what a shocker. That's how God is. He throws all these things into your life, and people into your life, and children into your life, and you didn't expect it. But down the road, it turns out to be a good thing. Because he knows the plan. He, has the, he knows the big picture. And it turns out to be good. So whatever it is you're going through right now that you think is just the most horrible thing in your life, one day you're going to turn around and you're going to say, God, I see how you use that thing in my life to change me and to make me more like you. So God wants us to follow him. He wants us to love him. He wants us to serve him. He wants us to pray like never before. And you know why he gives you all those troubles? Is so you'll pray like never before. And it's all those troubles that make us come to this realization that, God, I need you. I need you, Lord, to help me. I need you, God, to solve this problem because I cannot solve it. I need you, God, to bring me peace in the midst of the storm because the storm is crushing me, God. It is crushing me. The trial is so hard that I don't think I can bear it, Lord. But I know with you, there is, there is hope. I know that with you, you're going to do something in the midst of the struggle. And so this morning, I would ask you to ask the Lord. You Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. And I'd ask you to look at your life and ask yourself the first question is, am I truly a Christian? Am I truly a child of God? And I'm not asking you if you're perfect. I'm asking you, are you truly pursuing Jesus? Are you truly wanting to know him? Maybe you don't believe in him. Maybe you don't know if he's real. Maybe you're just looking to find out if he's real. Tell him. Say, God, I want to know if you're real. Show me, Lord. Show me if you're real. And I want to tell you, if you start reading your Bible and you start talking to God, you're going to find out it's real. Because the Bible is living and inspired and it's alive. 
And when you read it, God will begin to reveal himself to you through his word. And you will find out he's real. And I know this because I've lived this. And this morning, you ask yourself, examine your heart. Am I truly walking with Jesus? Have I really given Jesus 100% of my life? Or have I just been playing around? I go to church and I, yeah, and it's cool and it's good. But, but I really haven't applied myself to knowing Jesus. I would encourage you today to give your heart to Jesus. And then the second thing I would say is that no matter how hard the trial is, test him. Test him out. See if he won't take you through it. See if he won't help you get through it. And if you will one day look back and say, God was with me in that trial. And then the third thing I would ask you to do is to, to ask yourself, if you believe that you're a Christian that, and you are walking with Jesus, is he in your life? Do you feel his presence in you? And is he walking with you? And are you living with him? And is this the house of God? Is the house of God in you? And you need to ask the Lord to help you to, to help you to know that he, his presence is with you. His presence is with you. And then the fourth thing is whatever the small stuff is or the big stuff is in your life, give it to him. So right now, Jesus, we come to you. We thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that with you there is hope. There is hope. And no matter what the trial is today, we give it to you. Because, Lord, it's bigger than us. And we can't solve it. We can't fix it. We can't make it go away. Or we can't make it happen the way we think it should. But you know, Lord, how it should happen. You're in control. You're supreme. And you're in control. So, Lord, I, we give you our lives today. And we ask you, Jesus, to move in us. I pray, Lord, that whatever I've shared, that it would touch the hearts of the hearers, Lord, the ears of the hearers, the hearts of the hearers. And Lord, that you would remind us this week that you are a God and you love us. And I just pray that everyone would be encouraged today to follow you, Jesus, to test you out, to see that you are real. We just love you, God. We just praise you. We just worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. And, uh, Thank you for helping us, Lord. Thank you for helping us today. We worship you. There's this little chorus. It was one of the verses. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart oh god and renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from your presence and take not thy holy spirit from me Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Will you just tell him that today? Lord, I love you. I worship you. Let's just praise him for a moment. We praise you, we love you, we worship you. Thank you that you're supreme and in control of everything. And that we, as your children, have to learn, Lord, to rest in you and to wait on you for everything. Thank you for being with us. Bless everyone and bless their week. Go before them, Lord. Use them, Lord. Use them to share Jesus with those around them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thanks for listening. And Charles will be back next week. And. Uh,